Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the September ERM Toolbox webinar. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. First, if you dialed in by phone but haven't logged in by web and you would like to see the slides that will be shown, please point your web browser to readytalk.com. In the box where it says participant, join a meeting, enter the same access code that you use to join the call, 987-9821. Please stay aware of the level of background noise in your area, and if it starts to become noisy, uh, please put your phone on mute. If you're called away from your phone, please do not put it on hold, because that will cause your hold music to be transmitted to everybody. You can simply hang up, dial back in, and it will not disrupt the call. We are leaving the phone lines open, so if you have questions, you can ask them as they come up. Also, the chat box is available. If you type a question in the chat box, I'll be monitoring that, and we'll relay it to our presenter at an appropriate moment. So our presenter today is Christopher Moore from Marsh. Chris Moore is the West Coast Claims Advocate for the Financial and Professional Practice in Marsh's San Francisco office. He provides guidance to clients around complex claims issues involving securities litigation, regulatory investigations and proceedings, employment practices, all forms of professional liability, and special risk, as well as others. Chris? Uh, thank you very much, Emily. I appreciate it. Uh, I guess, first of all, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so I guess if anyone can't hear, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Emily, can I, am I coming through okay? It sounds clear from here. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your time this morning. I greatly appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Um, as Emily said, uh, we're, we're here to talk about directors and officers' liability, um, kind of specifically in the context of non or not-for-profit entities. So just very quickly, our agenda today what I, what I think makes sense is to sort of start with the big picture question of what are the potential liabilities for directors and officers of um, a not-for-profit entity, and then um, what protections are available from different sources for those liabilities, and that would include obviously DNO insurance, and then finally go through some of the uh, kind of at a pretty high level an overview of what a, a not for, typical not-for-profit DNO policy would cover. I would emphasize that this is a kind of gener generic or general discussion. Um, we are not going to get into specifics for uh, the University of California's coverage, just due to the complexity of the, of the entity and, and, and the insurance programs that are in place. Um, we're not able to do that in this environment. Uh, but if there are specific questions following the, the presentation about a particular situation, um, I think we would invite you to, uh, to talk to the folks at risk management about that. Um, as Emily said, I'm very happy to um, you know, have people jump in with questions as we go. Uh, so uh, you know, please feel free to do that. So anyway, on the first topic, um, hopefully you're now seeing a slide titled Directors and Officers Liability. Um, these are really the three core duties that um, directors and officers have. This is true for non, not for profits as well as other entities. So the duty of loyalty essentially uh, is exactly what it sounds like. You must be, you know, you put the interest of the of the entity first, and not use your position at at that uh, not for profit entity to somehow uh, advance your private interests. Um, you know, and against the interests of the entity. So the, the kinds of claims that you typically see that would arise that are kind of in the broad category of duty of loyalty would be conflicts of interest, um, you know, outright allegations of fraud, and then uh, potentially allegations of personal profit. Um, the next duty, duty of care, again, also kind of what it sounds like, you must act with reasonable care uh, or, or I'm sorry, care that a reasonably prudent person in the same position or a similar position would use. Um, what this really goes to is, is essentially negligence, but as we'll, as we'll go into a little bit more detail later, um, there are some statutes that, that give additional protection to uh, not-for-profit directors in, in most states. So in many instances, that you would actually have to be shown to have committed gross negligence, not, you know, routine negligence, but, but actual gross negligence for someone to be able to uh, succeed in a claim, a duty of care claim uh, against a director of a not-for-profit 
And then finally, there's the duty of obedience. Um, and essentially, this really is about obedience to two different things. One is the law in general, whatever you know, the, the law that is applicable uh, to the particular not-for-profit entity, but also it requires you to be compliant with the uh, governing documents of the, of the specific not-for-profit entity. Um, so anyway, I'll pause there. If there are any questions on that, that's fairly uh, basic overview. I'm hearing none. I will move to the next slide. And what we're going to talk about here now are some typical types of claims that we see for, for not-for-profit entities, and then in a minute talk about you know, the typical sources for those entities. Um, by far, the most, uh, the most common uh, type of claim that not-for-profit entities get is employment-related claims, what, you know, what we would in the insurance world call EPL, you know, Employment Practices Liability Claims. So claims for discrimination, sexual harassment, wrongful termination, et cetera. Um, the statistic here is from 2010 from the Towers Watson uh, DNO survey. Uh, so you can see that you know that that's a pretty big number. Two thirds of the claims come from employment-related uh, matters. Of the remaining, you know, one third of the claims, uh, the four biggest categories would be first of all misappropriation of funds. Um, typically, that would would be brought by a governmental entity or regulator, uh, you know, and obviously I think it's sort of self-evident what, what a misappropriation claim would be about. Um, next type of claim would be involving ERISA or the Employment Retirement Income Securities Act. So this is essentially uh, the act that governs 401k plans and pension plans and uh, welfare plans such as med medical care and so forth. And then the final two, two categories probably require a little bit of commentary. Um, direct DNO suits, the way I would kind of explain that would be uh, basically a suit against the directors and officers essentially saying that you've done something wrong and owe somebody damages as a result. So it's kind of a, a backward looking lawsuit. Um, the derivative DNO suit, uh, is kind of the opposite. It's, it's essentially a suit that is typically brought to prevent the, the board of directors from doing something that uh, the, the individual who's bringing the suit doesn't want them to, to do. So for example, um, you know, if you have a uh, not-for-profit entity uh, you know, that is a museum and the, the museum is planning to spend a lot of money to open a, a new wing that that uh, would exhibit a completely different style of art uh, than the original museum uh, was founded to uh, to display. Donors might sue and say, "Well, wait a minute, we we donated all this money on the on the assumption that you were going to um, you know stick with uh, you know." Renaissance art, and now you're now you're going to portray, you know, display modern art, and that's a violation of, of kind of the implied agreement that we that we had when we donated our money. So it's it, it's more typically, you know, trying to to influence the conduct of the of the entity going forward, um, whereas the direct DNO suit would be more uh, focused on action that's already happened, and now people are seeking some sort of damages. Um, before we move from this, I do want to kind of comment. You, if you're if you're looking, you know, if you if you Google this kind of thing, and there's a, there, there's lots of um, white papers and so forth that that may be you know unduly alarming. There's actually statistics that show that nonprofits are sued more are more likely to be sued. Or the, the, the directors and officers of nonprofits are more likely to be sued than for profits. Um, I think that that statistic is actually quite skewed by the fact, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later. Um, in a non-for-profit DNO policy, there's very broad coverage for the entity, and so EL claims wind up getting pretty much full-blown coverage when they're brought against a not-for-profit entity. In comparison, DNO policies for you know public companies or, or, or for-profit private companies 
uh, may not include entity coverage for EPL claims. So when, when you look at the, uh, the data for not-for-profit DNO claims versus for-profit DNO claims, um, what gets skewed is that the not-for-profit data will include those employment practices claims, which as you can see, make up 67% of the, of the claims. If you take those out of the picture, um, in fact, not-for-profit D's and O's are much less likely to see a DNO claim than their, their counterparts at for-profit companies. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, common sources of claims. Obviously, EPL claims are typically brought by employees, but might also include former employees or prospective employees who you know, were denied a job opportunity. Um, government and regulatory is another category. You know, that might typically uh, kind of align with the prior slide where we talked about um, misappropriation of funds or kind of other illegal activities. Um, Volunteers are another source of claims. It's essentially a special type of employee, and typically on a not-for-profit policy, you would, you would seek to amend the definition of employee to include volunteers so that these claims would be covered. Um, volunteers you know, could sue really for all the same reasons that employees would sue, discrimination, harassment, uh, invasion of privacy, but they also might sue for failure to hire to the extent that they're volunteering you know, in the hopes that their volunteer position will ultimately lead to a paid position, um, and if it doesn't, they might sue for, for failure to hire. Um, donors and beneficiaries are certainly a source of, uh, of uh, suits for not-for-profit entities. Um, the most typical claim would be, you know, misuse of the donated funds. Uh, if people donate the funds for a particular purpose, you know, that that purpose over time is not, is not being uh, is not a, where the money is going. Uh, you'll see that happen. Sometimes it's a generational thing where a family sets up a donation and you know, later generations might, might have a little bit of a change in focus and the, where they want to see the money go. Uh, so we've seen some of those cases. Um, you can also see claims where they're, in, and this is you know, not likely to be an issue for the, for the UC, but you know, for some smaller or newer uh, not-for-profit entities, the claims where there's a mis misrepresentation uh, allegation that the, that the entity misrepresented exactly what its purpose was and people made a donation on the basis of, of what they thought the entity was doing and in fact the entity's purpose was somewhat different from what they thought. Um, and then finally, you know, we have the, the all other category, other third parties. Um, so this would include potentially suppliers, service providers, and even other nonprofits. Um, what, what you typically see here would be some sort of contractual interference type claim. If, you know, if, if one nonprofit is <coughs> you know, potentially breaching a contract with a supplier or a service provider. Um, and then also intellectual property, depending on the type of nonprofit, uh, in some instances, in, intellectual property is involved, and so you could have uh, not-for-profits, you know, particularly you, you might imagine in the research uh, world uh, having litigation against each other over, over intellectual property issues. Uh, but I will now move on uh, to, you know, what I would call potentially emerging issues. These are not areas where we're seeing a lot of litigation, but perhaps are emerging areas uh, that people should kind of keep in mind. One is executive compensation. Um, there have been a few cases. One goes back a ways and was pretty egregious. You might remember United Way had a situation where uh, the director or executive director, in addition to having a pretty generous compensation package, was allegedly um, abusing the, the, the perks of the position, the expense account, that kind of thing. So you do get executive compensation issues. Um, um, bankruptcy, you know, obviously in the current environment that we've had for the last, whatever, four or five years, um, you know, as economic conditions have been tough for folks, both uh, 
potential private donors as well as government funding uh, being cut in a lot of, uh, in a lot of quarters. You know, there are some instances where not-for-profit entities are going under. Um, that can lead to some of the other types of claims that we talked about, employment practices claims arising from people having to be terminated. Um, donor claims, you know, arising from people that donated money, uh, you know, perhaps under the expectation or representation that that the that the entity was thriving and and only to find that it, it didn't make it, and then also perhaps some of those contractual issues that we talked about previously. Um, governance. This is sort of a broad category. Um, but, but you do get disputes over, you know, some of the larger nonprofits in terms of, you know, how they're supposed to be governed. Um, maybe the best way to explain this one, there's currently a dispute going on, you may have read about it in the papers, um, with respect to the, uh, in New York at the World Trade Center, the 9-11 the museum, um, is, there's a dispute over who should be funding it. Essentially, as I understand it, it's essentially a dispute between New York City on one side and then the Port Authority, which I guess is essentially an agency formed by the state of New York and the state of New Jersey jointly together. So there's some kind of dispute about who should really be funding it and, and um, that's kind of apparently delaying the, the process of opening the museum. So that would be kind of a governance type dispute. Um, this is, <clears throat> I don't know, this may or may not be applicable to the UC. Um, art provenance, we've seen some of this uh, for, you know, typically more for museums, uh, but, you know, to the extent that you may have collections and, and uh, other things in, at, at libraries, et cetera, uh, I suppose this is a possible exposure. But the, you know, the issue is sort of exactly what you would imagine. Um, you know, families or, or heirs, uh, and in some instances, instances, countries will make assertions that a particular piece of art or an antiquity in the museum, um, you know, rightfully belongs to that family or that or that country, and wound up in the museum through some sort of theft, or you know, it, obviously a lot of this involves. Uh, uh, seizure of, of art during the Holocaust by, by the Nazis and, and their, their allies. So there are some pretty well uh, publicized disputes there. And then finally, and this one might be, might be uh, re re relevant for the UC, you get politically motivated injunctive relief actions. And so again, injunctive relief, people are not looking for monetary damages, they're looking for a particular course of action or in action um, by the, by the not-for-profit entity. Um, so again, another example recently involves the 9-11 Museum. A group of atheists uh, sued uh, to demand that they would remove a steel cross, a steel cross from part of the exhibit um, because it was a, a religious, uh, a religious you know, representation. So those are probably, you know, you know obviously in relatively abbreviated form, the typical types and sources of DNO uh, claims for not-for-profits. Um, now I wanted to just talk a minute about you know, who typically buys not-for-profit DNO liability coverage. Um, this one is a little bit tough to speak to. There's, we don't really have hard data uh, that I've been able to find. You know, that will tell you that X percent of the not-for-profit entities buy DNO and Y percent do not. Um, but anecdotally, from what we see here at Marsh, um, what, I, what I can tell you is that the, the entities that, that do buy, not-for-profit entities that do buy uh, DNO, they typically are, you know, tend to be more sizable entities rather than, you know, very, very small kind of community level entities. Um, they, they definitely have to have some form of legal, it has to be a legal entity. I mean, it's most typically a not-for-profit corporation, but it can also be an association or a volunteer association. Uh, so there's various legal entities that can qualify, but there must be some sort of legal legal entity in place um, to to obtain the coverage. Um, the entity must be able to validate that it is a legitimate not-for-profit entity 
you know, and that's usually confirmed by confirming the status with the IRS. And then finally, uh, you know, it's important to note that while we're typically focused on the, the coverage for the directors and officers, board members, the trustees, however you want to phrase it, all of that coverage is obtained by having the entity purchase the DNO policy. So, you know, the, the whole ability to get coverage really begins with identifying the not-for-profit entity and then having that entity procure coverage for its directors, officers, trustees, employees, etc. Um, now, who doesn't, sorry, I didn't click the slide right. Hold on one second. Uh, who typically, uh, you know, does not, or at least in our anecdotal experience, you know, wh where do we see uh, situations where people that you might think would buy coverage, uh, in fact, do not buy coverage? Um, the, you know, it's hard to identify a, a broad category here, but, or a lot of specifics, I should say. What, what I do have is a broad category. So there are definitely a lot of entities, you know, including Marsh, where we have internally composed boards for various reasons. In fact, I serve on an advisory board, or I, actually I used to serve on an advisory board for the, the DNO practice here at Marsh. So these are boards where there's really no separate and distinct legal entity. Um, it's, you know, it was composed entirely of Marsh employees. You know, we had a mission statement and we had value proposition, but we really don't, didn't have any kind of governing document. We really didn't have a, you know, a legal ability to obtain DNO coverage, nor, you know, nor did we seek it. Um, so those, those sort of internal um, or informal boards, you know, while the, me the members may be called uh, board members or trustees or directors, um, if there's no real legal entity there, they probably don't have any kind of legal, uh, legal duty um, as a result of that role other than their duty as an employee of the entity that created the board. And similarly, we see the same thing with, you know, committees, uh, you know, again, really kind of same situation. If it's an entirely internal committee, we don't see those folks uh, looking to buy DNO insurance. And now uh, we talked about what some of the exposures are. Here's a, I just wanted to quickly talk about what some of the protections are for not-for-profit directors and officers. Um, most states, you know, including California, have very um, favorable laws that limit, that significantly limit the liabilities of directors and officers, particularly directors of non-profit organizations. Um, so typically what that what those statutes will do is um, they will eliminate a, an individual director's personal liability um, to the extent that they are a, a non-compensated uh, director of a not-for-profit not entity uh, for, for all discretionary decisions that they make, so long as those decisions were, number one, disinterested, meaning um, they did not breach the duty of loyalty and, and you know, have some sort of personal benefit. And number two, so long as the, the, their discretionary decision was not grossly negligent. And this is what I mentioned earlier. These liability statutes raise the, raise the bar for potential plaintiffs. They have to show gross negligence, not just mere negligence, to be able to succeed in a lawsuit against a not-for-profit director. Um, there's also a uh, federal law that's been out there, I guess, well, since 1997. The Volunteer Protection Act covers a, a wide swath of volunteers, but it, it also in, would include non-compensated, not-for-profit directors and has very similar limitations of liability so long as the conduct is not intentional or so long as the, the negligence is not gross negligence. Um, very important point to make here. The entity is always a key element of protection for directors and officers. You know, entity indemnification you know, is, is far more important, particularly for an entity the size of UC, um, than you know, insurance proceeds. Um, and and in, in fact, there are a lot of state stat states have very strict statutes 
that require um, mandatory indemnification uh, for uh, profit directors. Um, I would throw out here one more thing with respect that's kind of a little bit unique to the UC. Um, as I'm sure you all are probably aware, you're a, a, quite a unique organization. You know, I think kind of in some ways people view it as a, as a fourth branch of the California government. Um, so there are some governmental immunities that may be available uh, for some claims that, that would not be typical of other not-for-profit entities. So I just put a quick reference in there. I, I, Um, and then finally, um, you know, what, what, what is quite happily quite rare, but there are instances where, where an, an entity either cannot or, or does not indemnify a director or officer. Um, and then, you know, you would certainly look to insurance uh, to cover that. Um, but, you know, happily, because there are very broad indemnification provisions uh, for not-for-profit entities, it's pretty rare that you would have a claim that is not indemnifiable. Um, now we'll talk a little bit more about you know the ins and outs of D's and O's, but I, the point I want to make here is that you know some people view the the, the D and O policy as really being critical only in those rare instances where the entity uh, can't or for some reason won't indemnify the directors and officers, even though it covers it covers more than that. So let me pause there before we get into the um, specifics of DNO coverage. Did any? Do we have any questions? Hi, um, Chris. It's Katie Pickard. I did have a question regarding. Uh, you mentioned employees being on advisory boards, but we often have members of. Um, the uh, community on advisory boards within the UC campus uh, uh, or department, educational academic department world. Are those folk picked up um, automatically um, on such type bo uh, boards like the theater? Theater group has people within Hollywood. Um, uh, serving on department boards, theater boards, that are advisory boards to the departments. Yeah, I think Katie, like I just, like I, I, I mentioned at the at the beginning, I'm not sure if you were on. We're we're really trying to keep this a, a general discussion. So, you know, specific questions about actual specific entities or boards or or, or subdivisions within the UC, um, you know, because of the complexity of the of the entity and the complexity of the insurance program that's in place, we'll kind of we'll we'll have to respond to those sort of offline and, and maybe channel that through Grace's group. Um, but we're happy, you know, certainly happy to do that. But I just think we wanted to keep this more gen more generic uh, for today's okay. presentation. And Katie, okay. this is Norm uh, Hamill. You can also send that to Nicole or I. We have a mechanism in place where uh, the university will send them a letter uh, agreeing to indemnify them. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Norm. Appreciate it. All right. So moving forward on the on the DNO policy, I'm going to just quick. I, I've put this slide that you're now see in front of you that kind of just describes the three main insuring sections: the side A, side B, and side C. I'm going to move to the next slide because I think it's actually easier to walk through it graphically than than in, with the words. So this is a sort of uh, flow chart approach of, of looking at, at how a, D, a, a DNO policy would work. And this one is specific to not-for-profit Ds and Os. So if you look at the top left, I mean, the first question is, do you have a covered claim against an insured person as opposed to the entity? So if, if you have that scenario, the next question is, can the, in, the entity indemnify? If the answer is no, you go to the left, you have a, a you know, Side A or non-indemnifiable claim, and that would be covered by the, the DNO policy under insur insuring agreement A. Typically, um, we would view that as real personal asset protection. I mean, this is a situation where if you did not have the DNO policy, uh, the insured person would potentially have to pay out of out of pocket for a, for a claim. Very very rare in the not-for-profit world, but but you know. 
important that I point that out. More likely, uh, if you have a covered claim going back to the top, there are top left, covered claim against an insured person, it will be indemnifiable for, uh, by, by the entity, and uh, particularly the defense costs are almost always indemnifiable. So then you would have the, the entity essentially um, indemnifying the individual, and then the entity would turn around and seek coverage under the insurance policy under insuring agreement B for entity reimbursement. So here, even though it's the liability of an individual person, uh, the director or officer um, of, of the entity, the the, the, who really benefits from, from the insurance here, here is the um, and then now moving over to the right, now we're talking about a claim against the entity itself. Um, the, the, the claim would, would be naming the entity, for example, in a not in a employment practices claim or any other kind of claim. Um, so again, this, the, in, a, in the insurance vernacular, we refer to this as side C or clause C. So here the entity is you know, is, is the defendant, and clearly, um, you know, this is sort of balance sheet protection because the entity is is benefiting from coverage uh, for the insu you know from the insurance policy. So that's kind of the basic schematics of how a DNO policy works. Now, a little bit more detail um, in terms of who is covered. Uh, I think we've kind of spoken to this along the way, but. On a typical not-for-profit DNO policy, you would cover past, present, and future directors, officers. Actually, I didn't put it in there, but trustees, if you call them trustees, uh, as well as employees um, of, of the not-for-profit entity are covered. Um, that's different from the for-profit world. In the for-profit world, particularly publicly traded companies, employees are not included. So it is broader coverage under the not-for-profit policy. Um, this would include, you know, subsidiaries if it's a large entity and it has subsidiaries. It would include foreign-based subsidiaries and, to, and you know, foreign-based individuals who have an equivalent position to director or officer or trustee, but might call it something else as of the custom in that country. Um, another area where policies is different. Uh, not-for-profit policies are different. The entity is covered on a very broad basis, uh, including, importantly, for employment practices claims, which we saw earlier is where a lot of the action is uh, on the claims front. Um, as in, in comparison, uh, again, in the for-profit world, uh, typically the only um, coverage that would be available for the entity uh, for a publicly traded company is just for securities claims. For everything else, the entity has no coverage whatsoever on the typical for-profit uh, uh, policy. Now, important thing to point out, though, is even though it's a very broad coverage grant, there are some exclusions that tend to knock out a lot of what I would call typical general liability claims. So, for example, there's a bodily injury property damage exclusion. There's a pollution exclusion. So things that, that you know, are really intended more for a general liability policy will still get knocked out by the operation of those exclusions, but the coverage grant is quite broad. Um, here I want to just talk a little bit about you know, what, what are some of the, the typical coverage triggers, and essentially what is, what is a claim under the, the typical not-for-profit DNO policy. Um, so there's really kind of three broad categories. The first is kind of the most hard to describe. But most policies have a provision that, that would include as a part of the definition of claim a written demand for monetary damages or non-monetary damages or relief. Um, so there it would, it, you know, it could be a letter, it could even be an email where someone is making a demand on an insured. Um, usually has to specify, you know, what wrongful act has been committed against them, and then obviously would have to specify what, what relief they're looking for, either monetary damages or some, some kind of non-monetary relief. Um, 
The second category I think is a little bit more familiar to everyone. Any kind of civil, criminal, administrative, regulatory, or arbitration proceeding. So basically a lawsuit or anything kind of similar to a lawsuit uh, would also trigger coverage. And then finally, this last prong, uh, most policies would include some level of coverage for formal, and I would emphasize formal, um, investigation, so civil, criminal, or administrative, or regulatory investigations, but only with respect to insured persons. Usually this coverage is limited to the individuals, not the entity. And again, usually some level of formality is required. Um, the policies vary quite a bit on how they, how they reach that, but they, you typically need to have a certain kind of formal like order of investigation, some kind of document from the regulatory body that's investigating the individuals that makes it clear that they, they are targeting and investigating that particular individual. Um, as I noted before, the suit must allege a wrongful act. Wrongful act is very, very broadly defined. It really, you know, could be any kind of breach of duty, neglect, error, uh, misstatement, misleading statement, omission. Some policies actually just use the word act as part of the definition of wrongful act. So, um, you know, quite broad, but, but there must be a reference, you know, in either the written demand, the proceeding, or in the, in the investigation, there must be some reference to what it is the person is alleged to have done wrong. And then finally, capacity. Um, the, the, the alleged wrongful act must have been committed or alleged to have been committed by the individual while they were acting in their capacity as a director, officer, or employee of the not-for-profit entity. Um, the capacity issue tends to be a more important issue in the not-for-profit world because in many instances people are serving on the, on the board, uh, you know, of a, of a non-profit and may also have, you know, you know they have a full-time job or maybe, you know, maybe they are, they're an employee of of the UC or a professor, and then they're also serving on a board. So you, you have to be, be careful to distinguish um, you know, what, what capacity was the person acting in um, you know, when they committed the act or the alleged act that is the subject of the litigation. So that, you know, that's an important point to, to keep track of as you, as you go forward. Um, now, I'm going to quickly go through, and I think we're getting close on time, but anyway, um, quickly go through what is covered and then a little bit what isn't covered. So basically, damages, settlements, judgments, and defense costs are the main, you know, the main things that are covered. Uh, so, you know, from, from in a way that's backward, typically you get defense costs first as you defend the claim, and then either a settlement or a judgment. Um, depending on how the claim resolves. Um, what isn't covered, really most, in most of this category what we're looking at are things that are potentially not insurable under applicable law. So civil or criminal fines and penalties are typically not covered. Um, if you're found to owe taxes, um, that is typically not covered. Uh, punitive and exemplary damages are typically not covered, although some policies do make an exception and at least uh, try to offer up coverage to the extent that damages insurable um, in, in a venue that is available to the uh, particular dispute in question. So there is a potential to get coverage for punitive damages depending on where uh, the dispute arises and what the law is in that in that in that jurisdiction. Um, amounts for which insurers are not liable, that may sound like an odd one, but, but if there's a situation where someone's paying kind of on a voluntary basis is paying money that they're really not liable for, um, carriers certainly are not going to, are not going to cover that. So uh, that one rarely comes up, but it, but it should be noted. And then there's just a general provision in most policies that say that they're not going to cover anything that's uninsurable. So to the extent that there are other 
categories of, of loss that are not insurable in a particular jurisdiction, the carriers are not going to violate the law and cover, cover that matter. Um, now, I kind of want to go quickly through, and I think this is the last slide, just some of the, the coverage exclusions that are pretty typical um, in really all policies, but including not-for-profit DNO policies. Um, I've tried to kind of lump them into categories. So the first category is conduct exclusion. So these are uh, exclusions that go to specific conduct by third persons. Um, so one uh, is illegal gain or advantage. This is sometimes also referred to as proper profit. Um, second one, illegal, illegal remuneration. So someone who uh, is able to manipulate things so that they get paid more than they were supposed to get paid on profit. And then finally, you know, fraudulent, dishonest, or criminal acts. Um, so important point to note, though, for all of these, these exclusions typically trigger um, only after there is an actual final adjudication against an insured person that they have you know, committed fraud or obtained proper profit. So at least during the, the point, the, the, the process where you're, you know, forced to defend yourself against the allegation that you committed fraud, the policy should respond and provide, you know, kind of a defense war chest for you. Um, and then, you know, if, if, if it gets to the point where an individual is found to have committed fraud, then that person would certainly lose coverage uh, but the, the rest of the insured persons would not. That's a concept called severability. I'm not going to get into great detail on that, but, but you know, the in, innocent individuals would, be, would still be protected. Now the next category are for exposures that essentially the DNO carriers expect you to have them insured under other policies. So I think some of this is pretty self-evident. So BIPD, bodily injury, property damage, that should be covered by a general liability policy. Um, they're excluding ERISA claims on the assumption that you're buying fiduciary liability. Um, they will exclude professional liability, errors and omissions type claims, um, again on the assumption that that insurance is available. And then pollution liability, uh, again if you, uh, on the assumption that you're buying pollution coverage or perhaps it's in included in one of your other policies. And then finally, I have just kind of one last category here, claims that may be collusive. Um, and this is really just the insured versus insured exclusion. Um, but, the, you know, the reason that, that carriers have an insured versus an insured exclusion in their DNO policy, and in many other policies, I suppose, um, is to avoid any kind of collusive lawsuit where one insured is suing the other really just for the point of, of accessing the assets of the policy and they don't have a true, a true dispute. That's the purpose of the exclusion. Unfortunately, there are certainly fact patterns where there are insureds suing other insureds where it's not collusive, it's real, there's an ab absolute you know, nasty dispute, but, but the exclusions uh, un unfortunately will often, you know, will often knock out those non-collusive ones as well as the collusive ones. Um, we, you know, we work hard to, to make as many exceptions to that exclusion as we can, um, but there is definitely still a risk that an insured versus insured claim will not be, ex will not be covered by a, by a DNO policy. So that um, is the end of my plan presentation, and I'm actually right on time. <laughs> and so we left time to have uh, any additional questions and answers, so I, I'll open it up to any additional questions that there might be out there. Do we have any questions? No? Well. All right, well, I very much appreciate um, your time today, and I hope, I hope that Cover the material that you were, you guys were, were looking to, to cover. Um, I'm very happy to if if anyone has questions that come up, 
I'm happy to you know take questions privately to the extent that I can, that I can answer them. Um, so Emily, I'm not sure what the protocol is to, to wind this down. Do we just? Uh, I'll, not. Um, I'll just wrap it up a little bit. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, as Chris said, if you have questions, uh, you can email him. And of course, uh, for any questions about a specific uh, matter, please contact Risk Services. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again at future Toolbox webinars. Bye.